Yeah, so this is the last phase of gastric secretion. It's called the intestinal phase. So now the chyme has moved into the duodenum. So there is gastric emptying of chyme into the duodenum that will stimulate those cells that are producing cholecystokinin. They are called eye cells. So the eye cells will be stimulated to produce cholecystokinin. Then the mucosal cells, uh, some of them, they'll be stimulated to produce a lot of gastric inhibitory peptide. Then we have the A cells that will be stimulated mainly by the hydrogen ions. So a decrease in pH is stimulating a lot of the A cells to produce a lot of secretin. So these hormones now will be transported by circulation back to the stomach. And in the stomach, it's going to inhibit the chief cells, the parietal cells. So the secretions are going to reduce here. So pepsinogen secretion will reduce. The hydrochloric acid intrinsic factor secretion is also going to reduce. Then they are also inhibitory to the smooth muscle cells. So they will cause hyperpolarization of smooth muscle cells. They become less excitable. So once the smooth muscle cells are less excitable, they can't easily contract. So you find that the stimulation of these smooth muscle cells is inhibited. Then the motility also reduces. That will also reduce the emptying of chyme into the duodenum. Okay, so the secretions are reducing during the intestinal phase of gastric secretions. Okay, so the, those are the three phases. So even here, it's just one and the same. Even this is just summarizing what I've already discussed with you. Okay. So the secretions in the fundus and the body, so we say different parts of the stomach will produce different secretions. So the most characteristic secretions derived from the glands in the fundus and the body of the stomach. So here you have two types of uh, cells that you are going to find in the fundus and the body. They will have a lot of parietal cells that are producing hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor then the chief cells that are producing pepsinogen and gastric lipase. So much of the hydrochloric acid and the cells, they will be produced within the fundus and the proximal part of the body. So in this diagram, you can see that the fundus and the proximal part of the body, they do contain a lot of parietal cells that are producing hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. Then they also contain the chief cells that are producing pepsinogen. Okay, the stimulus, it could be the vagus nerve that is releasing acetylcholine. So acetylcholine will stimulate these cells to increase the secretions. Then it will be inhibited by atropine because atropine is anticholinergic drug that can inhibit the interaction between acetylcholine and mascarinic receptors. So that will reduce the production of these secretions. Then you can also see that in the antrum, you have more of G cells and mucus cells that are producing mucus and the G cells that we are producing gastrin. So for them to produce this gastrin, the, uh, the vagus nerve, which is uh, the parasympathetics, they are releasing a different neurotransmitter here. They are not releasing acetylcholine. Instead, they are releasing gastrin, releasing peptide. So gastrin releasing peptide is the one that is stimulating the G cells to produce a lot of gastrin. But you know to say that the G cells can also be stimulated by the byproducts of protein digestion, like peptides, you know, carbohydrates, amino acids, can also stimulate the G cells to produce a lot of gastrin. Gastrin will be transported by circulation to the parietal cells and the chief cells to increase the production of hydrochloric acid. So you can see here, that the production of hydrochloric acid is also facilitated by gastrin that is coming from the G cells. Then the same gastrin, you know to say you have the ECL cells. The ECL cells, they are enhanced by hydrochloric acid and, and gas, um, they, are, they are going to stimulate the ECL. The ECL is going to produce histamine. So the gastrin can also stimulate the ECF cells to produce histamine, and the histamine has got stimulatory effect on the parietal cells. So it's going to stimulate the parietal cells to produce a lot of hydrochloric acid. Okay, so here is just showing you the receptors to which these neurotransmitters or hormones can go and bind. 
So the fundus, we say it has got a lot of parietal cells in the chief cells that produces pepsinogen. Parietal cells are producing hydrochloric acid. So the vagus nerve is going to release acetylcholine and this acetylcholine via the M2 receptors is going to stimulate the parietal cells to release a lot of hydrochloric acid, which you can see that. The same acetylcholine can also stimulate the H cells. The H cells are the same ECL cells. So these are histamine producing cells. So they can also be referred to as the H cells. So the H cells will produce a lot of histamine and histamine will go and bind to histamine receptors to increase the production of hydrochloric acid. Then you also know to say that the same histamine, okay, will be stimulated to be produced because of gastrin. Gastrin, uh, they, they are being produced by the G cells, especially in the antrum of the stomach. So the amino acids they are stimulating the G cells, even the, the acidity, if the acidic environment is, if the pH is increasing, it will stimulate the G cells to produce a lot of gastrin. If the pH is reducing, it will be inhibitory to the G cells. So the G cells are also stimulated by the vagus nerve. We say that there's a neurotransmitter that is being released here, which is called gastrin, releasing peptide, stimulating the G cells to increase the production of gastrin. This gastrin will be transported by circulation. Then it will go and bind to the gastrin receptors in the ECL cells or the H cells to increase the production of histamine. The histamine will increase the production of hydrochloric acid or the same G cells can also go and bind to, uh, and the same gastrin can go and bind to certain receptors like CCKB receptors to enhance the production of hydrochloric acid. So you see the effect of gastrin on the secretions in the stomach. But you know to say we have also the D cells. So the D cells are found in the fundus. They are also found in the antrum. So these D cells can be stimulated by <clears throat> calcitonin gene-related peptide so you have calcitonin generated peptide that can stimulate the D cells to produce somatostatin. So somatostatin is inhibitory. So it's going to inhibit the ECL to produce histamine. So histamine production will be less, then there'll be less stimulation by histamine to, pro to stimulate the pareto cells for the production of hydrochloric acid. So more of somatostatin, it means less of hydrochloric acid because it's inhibiting the H cells to produce a lot of histamine. Then you can also see in the antrum, the somatostatin is inhibiting the D cells to produce a lot of gastrin. So here is produced, is inhibiting the H cells to produce less of histamine. Here is inhibiting the G cells to produce less of gastrin. So overall, the gastric secretions are going to reduce because of somatostatin. So this is going to control the production of gastric secretions or the release of gastric secretion. So that slide in this one is the same. Even here, it's the same thing. So you have the antrum of the stomach and the fundus. So in the fundus, you have the gastric pits. In the antrum, you also have gastric pits. So there are different types of cells that you found that you're going to find there. So in the antrum, you have a lot of these D cells and you also have the G cells. So the G cells, like I said, they're being stimulated by gastrin releasing peptide. So they'll produce a lot of gastrin. The D cells, they're being stimulated by hydrogen ions. So if the pH is very acidic, the D cells will be overstimulated to release somatostatin. That will inhibit the G cells to produce gastrin. Gastrin is transported by circulation to the other cells. So it will be transported to the fundus to have an effect on these other cells. So gastrin can stimulate the ECL to produce a lot of histamine. Then histamine can stimulate the parietal cells. It can also stimulate the chief cells to produce a lot of pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid. Then I said that the ECL can also be stimulated by acetylcholine. So you can see acetylcholine is stimulating the ECL to increase the production of histamine that will have an effect on the parietal cells and also the chief cells. Okay, so that's why I'm saying it's basically just one and the same information. Okay, maybe something new here. 
So you know the physiology, but now let's just discuss the clinical aspect of those secretions. So you know what is regulating those secretions, but in case of peptic ulcers or duodenal ulcers, gastric ulcers or duodenal ulcers or esophageal ulcers, so those ulcers, what sort of drugs can you use to inhibit the secretions of acids? So these are some of the drugs that you can use. So we can see here, you have these uh, cells that are producing the acids or they're producing the mucus and bicarbonates or they're producing the enzymes. So you can take advantage of these drugs to inhibit the production of acids because in gastric uh, ulcers or peptic ulcers, you don't want a lot of acids because acids are the ones that are eating up the mucosa. So you need to minimize the production of acids. So how can you minimize that? So there are a number of drugs that you can use. So we have histamine antagonists or histamine blockers. So here we say that the ECL produce a lot of histamine. Then histamine will go and bind to histamine two receptors to stimulate the parietal cells to produce a lot of hydrogen ions. So if you have histamine blockers, it's going to inhibit the interaction between histamine and the parietal cells, so these receptors. So the production of hydrochloric acid is going to reduce. That's why in ulcers, you can use histamine antagonists. Anticholinergics, I've already mentioned to say anticholinergics like uh, atropine. Atropine is going to to inhibit the interaction between acetylcholine and the M3 receptors. So you have the muscarinic receptors, the M receptors. So you know to say when acetylcholine goes and binds to M receptors, it's going to stimulate these cells to increase the secretions. So if you are blocking the interaction between acetylcholine and the M receptors, it means the secretions of acid is going to reduce and also secretions of pepsinogen is going to reduce. That's why you can use anticholinergic drugs like atropine. Mesoprostol, mesoprostol can also be used. Mesoprostol is an example of prostaglandins analog. So in terms of structure, it looks like prostaglandins. And you know to say prostaglandins, they can stimulate the mucosal cells that are producing mucus and bicarbonates. So it will increase the production of mucus and bicarbonates, which you want to have more when a person is having ulcers then it can inhibit the parietal cells to produce acids. So acid production is going to reduce with mesoprostol because it will function as prostaglandins, PGE2 and PGI2. So it will go and stimulate the cells to, to increase the production of mucus and bicarbonates. That will cover the areas where you have ulcers and the bicarbonates will neutralize the acid. So we'll provide time now for that wound to heal. So you can use mesoprostol in ulcers, especially the healing of ulcers. But remember mesoprostol can cause contraction of the uterus. So the uterus, you have smooth muscle cells there. So it's not recommended to be used in females because it can bring about the uterus contraction. So you have cramps in females and it can also initiate abortion if the female is pregnant. So those vigorous, massive contraction of the uterus can actually lead to miscarriages or abortion. So it's not recommended in females, mesoprostol. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, these are going to worsen to some extent ulcers. Why is because the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can increase the production of acids. So if they are increasing the production of acids, then it can worsen the situation. But you know to say when you have ulcers, there is some sort of inflammation that is taking place there. So you can use low dose of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs just to minimize on inflammation that is worsening the ulcers there. So it can be used, but it's not really very recommended to use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in peptic ulcers. Then you can also use proton pump inhibitors. Proton pump inhibitors, they are going to inhibit their hydrogen pumps. That's why they are called proton pumps. So the sodium potassium HPS pump is going to be inhibited. So you are not uh, 
you are not pushing these hydrogen ions into the lumen of the stomach. So by so doing, you are reducing the production of acids. So proton pump inhibitors, you can use them. Then sucrophate, so you can also use sucrophate. So these will bring about luminal coating. So it's just going to function more like mucus that is covering the lumen of the intestine. So it's covering the mucosal, mucosal cells of the intestines or maybe the stomach or the esophagus. So that can also help in healing with the ulcers. Bismuth and also antibiotics. There are certain antibiotics that you can use. So the antibiotics that you want to use here are those that are going to target the Helicobacter pylori. Remember the H. pylori is also encouraging the production of hydrochloric acid. Sometimes it can also be involved in initiation or can also trigger ulcers. It can also trigger cancer. So it can trigger cancers in the stomach. So you want to have antibiotics that will target the H. pylori to minimize the production of acids as well. So you have carithromycin, you know, you have the fragile or the metrodidazole, all those, they can be used to target the H. pylori, especially the carithromycin and lasoplazole. So those, they will target the the H. pylori to minimize the amount of H. pylori. Then you can also use the octreotide. The octreotide, these are somatostatin analogs. So they are more like somatostatin and we have already said today somatostatin is going to inhibit the secretions. Okay, so those are some of the drugs. So this is just a clinical application of what we've learned. So you're taking advantage of the physiology that you know, and you'll be able to understand the mode of action for these drugs that are being used for ulcers. So mechanism for pepsin release. So you know to say that there are certain factors that are stimulating the chief cells to release a lot of pepsin. So this pepsin is being released in form of pepsinogen, which is a precursor for pepsin. So for pepsin to be activated, you need hydrochloric acid you know, to expose the site that is involved in, uh, in breaking down of proteins, the catalytic site of pepsinogen, it has to be exposed by hydrochloric acid. So the hydrochloric acid do activate pepsinogen into pepsin, then the pepsin can do auto activation. So it can go and activate the other pepsinogen into pepsin. Then the pepsin will start the digestion of proteins into peptides. But you know to say you require hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid, where is it coming from? It's coming from the parietal cells. So the parietal cells are producing hydrochloric acid and this hydrochloric acid and the intrinsic factor, the hydrochloric acid is the one that is activating the pepsinogen into pepsin. So the acidity alters the shape of pepsinogen exposing its active site so that this site can act on other pepsinogen molecules to break off a small chain of amino acids from their ends. Cleavage converts pepsinogen to pepsin, and the pepsin is active only in the presence of high hydrogen concentrations in low pH. So the pH should be less than five. Otherwise, if the pH is alkaline, then the pepsin won't be that active. But for you to have activation of pepsin, you need the factors that will stimulate the production of hydrochloric acid. So you can see the parietal cell that is being stimulated by these factors, the gastrin, histamine, acetylcholine, and somatostatin is inhibitory, but these other ones are stimulatory. So when they come and bind to these receptors, they will activate the G-protein coupled receptors, and then they will generate second messengers that are involved in translocation of the pumps. So you can see a vesicle that is containing the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump. So it needs to be translocated to be embedded within the apical side of the parietal cells. So once they're embedded within the apical side of the parietal cells, then they'll start the pumping activity, exchanging potassium for hydrogen ions. Then the hydrogen ion will combine with chloride for the production of hydrochloric acid. So you can see here that there is this pump that is being translocated on the apical side. So the potassium is brought in by potassium channels. 
So on the basolateral side of the membrane, we have sodium potassium ATPase pump that is pumping three sodium outside and two potassium into the cells. And via the potassium leaky channel, some of this potassium will leak out of the cell into the lumen. And then this potassium will be exchanged for hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions are coming from that reaction, whereby water is reacting with carbon dioxide, giving you carbonic acid, which is a weak acid. It will dissociate into hydrogen and bicarbonates. So the hydrogen will be exchanged for potassium. Then you have bicarbonate chloride exchanger on the basolateral side of the cells. So these bicarbonates that are produced in this equation, they will be exchanged for chloride. And this chloride will move via chloride channel. So this is a facilitated diffusion of chloride into the lumen. This chloride is combined with hydrogen ions for the formation of hydrochloric acid that is required to convert pepsinogen to pepsin. Same information. So this is just a step-by-step -step process that you understand how hydrochloric acid is being produced in the pareto cells. So you have the blood there that will bring carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, it will just diffuse into the pareto cells. Then it will react with water giving you carbonic acid. So the enzyme that is catalyzing this reaction is carbonic anhydrase. The carbonic acid is a weak acid. It's going to dissociate into hydrogen ions and bicarbonates. The hydrogen ions, the bicarbonates, they are going to be exchanged for chloride and the hydrogen ions will be exchanged for potassium. So you have potassium hydrogen ATPS pump. So these are the proton pumps or the hydrogen pumps that are producing acids. So the hydrogen ion is being pushed into the lumen. Then the bicarbonates are going to be exchanged with chloride. So you can see chloride there that is exchanging the bicarbonates. It's being exchanged with bicarbonates. So chloride bicarbonate exchanger. And this chloride, when it enters the cell, it will leave the cell via the chloride channels. Then the chloride will react with hydrogen ions to form hydrochloric acid. There are a lot of electrolytes in the lumen that will now facilitate paracellular movement of water into the lumen. So you have secretions that are coming from the pariet parietal cells. So in the lumen of the stomach, the pH is very acidic because of the hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. So the pH will be less than two, but you realize to say that the mucosal cells, so these cells, the pH will be somewhere around seven, which is neutral or 7.4. So that is possible because the mucus that are covering the mucosal cells and also the bicarbonates that are neutralizing the acids. Okay, so same information. So this is the mucus that is protecting the cells and the bicarbonates that will neutralize the acid. So you have two layers here. So the first layer is just a layer of mucus which will provide a physical barrier. That will provide a physical barrier to the to the cells so that they are protected from the hydrochloric acid. Then you have the, the bicarbonates that is being released by these cells that will neutralize the acid. So it's a chemical barrier to the hydrochloric acid. So you find that the surface of the mucosal cells, the pH is somewhere around seven, which is almost neutral, but in the lumen or the stomach, the pH is very acidic because of the hydrochloric acid there, okay? Then the stomach is also responsible to release certain uh, hormones, which we've discussed to some extent. So we have gastrin hormone that is produced by the mucosal cells in the pyloric antrium area of the stomach. And also in the duodenum, we have a bit of G cells that can produce uh, gastrin. So the, the production stimuli, what is going to stimulate the production of gastrin is the presence of peptides and amino acids. Then the target organ is the stomach. Then of course, it's going to increase the secretion of gastric glands. It's also going to promote gastric emptying. So gastrin is increasing the motility and the secretions in the stomach. In the small intestines, it's going to promote intestinal muscle contraction. So even in the stomach, in the intestines, gastrin will increase the motility. In the ileocecal valve, it's going to cause relaxation of the ileocecal valve. So it's involved in ileum emptying. So the ileum is going to empty its content into the cecum via the opening of the ileocecal valve. 
So gastrin is going to facilitate also uh, the, the emptying of ilia. Gastrin will have an effect on the large intestine, so it will trigger mass movements. So it will trigger peristaltic contractions in the large intestines. Okay, so the stimuli, the factors that are stimulating gastric release and inhibiting gastric release, we've already discussed that. Then we have other hormones like ghrelin that is also being secreted by the stomach. So the ghrelin is being produced by the ghrelin producing cells in the mucosa of the stomach, especially the fundus of the stomach. That's where you find this ghrelin producing cells. The stimulus is fasting. When the GIT is empty, the ghrelin producing cells will be stimulated to release a lot of ghrelin. Then it will have an effect on the hypothalamus, especially the hunger center, which is the lateral hypothalamic nuclei. So the lateral hypothalamic nuclei will be stimulated so that the amount of food that you're going to take in is going to increase. So your hunger is going to be stimulated. So ghrelin is also referred to as the hunger hormone because it's stimulating the hunger center in the hypothalamus. Then histamine is produced by stomach mucosal cells. So we say the ECL are the ones that are producing histamine. The stimulus that is producing histamine is uh, when you have food in the stomach. So those chemicals in the stomach will stimulate the ECL cells to produce a lot of histamine. Then the target, the target organ in the stomach, it will stimulate the parietal cells to release a lot of hydrochloric acid. Serotonin is also being uh, secreted by stomach mucosal cells. So in presence of the food again in the stomach, then the target organ is the stomach itself. It will increase the contraction of the stomach. So serotonin is going to increase uh, mixing contractions in the stomach and also peristaltic contractions and gastric emptying is going to be enhanced by serotonin. Somatostatin, somatostatin is being produced by the D cells in the stomach. So especially in the antrum, in the duodenum, you have the D cells that are producing somatostatin in the presence of food in the stomach. So that's a stimulus and also the sympathetic axon stimulation. So somatostatin is going to have an effect on the stomach. It's going to restrict all gastric secretions and motility. So it's going to reduce gastric secretions and motility. Then it has got an effect on the pancreas as well. It's going to restrict pancreatic secretions. Then it has got an effect on the small intestines. It's going to reduce intestinal absorption and also motility. So remember, somatostatin is inhibitory in function, okay? So those are the secretions that are coming from the stomach. Okay, so I think for this lecture, that's where we're going to end. And next time we'll look at the secretions in the small intestines. Thank you very much.